We're pretty good at making plans, right? How many of you have already got your plans figured out for lunch? Amen? Look around, a couple of us. How many of you know where your next trip is going to be? Your next vacation is going to be? How many of you know what's going to happen this school year? How many things you're going to participate in? Listen, all of us love to make plans. We were wired that way. We were wired to think about the future. We are wired to set goals for the future. But none of us are promised tomorrow. Here's what it says in James chapter four, verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will will be. Listen to this. He says, for you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. In this verse, God describes my life and your life as vapor. Vapor. Here for a second and then gone. And yet most of us hear that. And if we're being brutally honest, we would have to admit that we feel like we are exempt from that verse. We feel like our lives are different than everybody else's life. We feel like we're invincible, we're immortal, and nothing will ever happen to us. That stuff happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. But the truth is, life as we currently know it can change in a moment. About a week before Christmas, just a few weeks ago, our family walked through a scary incident, one that I haven't shared publicly before today. One minute our kids were leaving the house for school and everything in our life, everything in our family was normal and everything in our life and our family was fine. Uh, but about five minutes after they left, the phone rang and the voice on the other end of the line let us know that our two kids traveling to school had just been involved in a major accident, a head-on collision. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. That was one of those moments I'll never forget in my life. I'll never forget the feeling as a dad hearing that news reported. And I promise you, I will never forget what it was like to pull up to the scene of the accident. As a dad, that image will be embedded into my brain for the rest of my life on planet Earth. Now, I can tell you right now, we give all glory to God and we can praise him today because everybody involved in that accident is fine and miraculously walked away. But as a parent, that was one of those moments in my life when, when I really understood how fragile life on planet earth really is. And I realized how quickly life can change. You know, you walk away from a moment like that in your family or in your life, and, and you can't help but wondering certain things and asking certain questions. And one of the questions that, that I've continually thought about, even since that moment, is this. What are we going to do with this life? I mean, what are we going to do with our, our vapor moment on planet Earth? Like, God gives us a blink of an eye in, in the scope of eternity, and, and yet we get an opportunity to steward that gift from God either for him or not for him, in obedience or disobedience. We get to be faithful to him with this vapor or we get to be unfaithful to him with this vapor. It's like that. Let me ask you a question. A hundred million years from this moment, what is it that's really gonna matter? I mean, would you change your perspective for just this, this brief moment of the message and just think about this with me for a second? A hundred million years from today, it's hard to even imagine. But in that moment, do you really believe it's going to matter how much money you made on planet Earth or how successful you were or what other people thought about you? Is it really going to matter how many followers you had on Facebook or how many people liked you on the TikTok? I mean, I mean is it going to matter what kind of car you drove or what kind of house you lived in or really what your job was or, or any of that stuff? Let me just say it this way. None of that stuff is going to matter. A hundred million years from this moment, the only thing that's going to matter is if you are in heaven or if you are in hell. And the only thing that's going to matter is if your friends are in heaven or if they're in hell. If your family members are in heaven or if they're in hell, it's the only thing that's going to matter. 
And so here's the way I'm thinking these days. If that's the only thing that's gonna matter a hundred million years from today, then it should probably be one of our main concerns today. Listen, what are you doing today that's gonna matter a hundred million years from this moment? You know, you open up your Bible to 2 Corinthians 5.10 and this is what it says, for we must all, when it says all, it's talking about all of us, all right? He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let me ask you a question. When you read something like that in the Bible, do you really believe that's gonna happen? Do you believe that every single follower of Jesus Christ is gonna stand before his throne someday? Because I do. The Bible says it very clearly. It says that all of us are gonna have this moment where we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the God of the universe. And I believe with all of my heart that in that moment, we are going to be held accountable. We are going to be responsible for the things that we did on planet earth and the things that we didn't do on planet earth. Did we obey Jesus Christ in our life? Did we give in a way that was pleasing to him? Did we give glory to God with our life and in our language and the things that we did and the things that we said? Did, did we magnify Jesus and share Jesus with the lost people that he intentionally put in our path for this reason? And I believe all of that stuff is gonna be talked about in that one-on-one -on -one meeting with God. You know why? Because he says all of that stuff is important. Listen, do you ever just imagine what it's gonna be like to stand before God? To stand before Jesus? It's gonna happen. And I just bet you in that moment, we are going to be overwhelmed with how real he is. We're gonna be overwhelmed with how holy he is. And I bet you in that moment, we are going to fully understand how short this life on planet earth really was. When we meet Jesus, I believe we will be able to clearly see how he positioned us in this life and how he designed us to build his kingdom and to share his love. I think that we're going to see missed opportunities and we're going to be able to fully grasp how the devil worked overtime to prevent us from, from magnifying Jesus and being faithful to him. I mean, if our future selves could come back right now and coach ourselves up, I bet you anything that we would be challenging ourselves to do whatever it takes to share Jesus with our lost friends right now. We would be challenging ourselves to point people to Christ. We would challenge ourselves to be bold for Jesus and persistent in sharing the gospel while there were still the moments in our vapor. We would remind ourselves that today approximately 150,000 people are gonna die. They're gonna leave life on planet earth and enter into a real eternity and a real place called heaven or a real place called hell. Listen, lost people are everywhere. They're everywhere. And Jesus tells us it is our job. You have one job, right? You have one job and that's to share Jesus with the lost people so that they too can be saved. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, he says, for everyone, right? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him if they haven't believed in him? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Man, Jesus just said through Paul, he said, if you're sharing Christ with your words and your life and your influence, if you're leveraging everything God's blessed you with for his kingdom, pointing people to Jesus, he said, you got some beautiful feet. Now you got some funky toenails, but you got some beautiful feet, right? I mean, he's like, you have beautiful feet because you've been faithful to walk the path that I told you to walk. You've been faithful to share the message that I told you to share. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he understood God's playbook. He knew that we as Christians, what we as a part of God's team were supposed to do while we were still here on planet earth. And the reason that Paul knew that is because Jesus had already given him and us the great commission. What is the great commission? You know, we talk about the great commission a lot, but do you really understand what this great commission really is? Well, it is the first thing that Jesus told his 11 disciples after rising from the dead and appearing to them in Galilee. The Great Commission was Jesus's final instructions before breaking the huddle. 
This was Jesus giving them the play that they were supposed to run until he returned at the end of the age. He said, this is what you're supposed to do. I'm going to make it abundantly clear. This is your job. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, you read the words of Jesus. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what is the great commission? It's Jesus coming out and saying, here's your job. You ready? Make disciples. Make disciples. Which includes sharing the gospel, leading people to faith in Christ, baptizing them, teaching them how to know Christ and follow Jesus, and how to share Jesus with other people. But notice this entire process begins with us taking a step of faith to share Christ with other people. Us sharing the gospel so that other people could be saved by him. And Paul doesn't just leave us hanging on this. He actually tells us how that we're supposed to share the gospel. This is what he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. He said, preach the word. He's not talking to just people who are like me that preach for, this is like my vocation. He's saying to believers, followers of Christ, disciples, your job is to preach the word. He said, be ready in season and out of season to correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and teaching. So Paul tells us there's only two times in your life where you're supposed to share the gospel. You ready? In season and out of season. He said anything other than that would just be wrong, so don't do it, all right? So in season, share the gospel. When you're out of season, share the gospel. Do you get that today? He said, believer, you gotta be ready at all times to share the gospel. And yet many of us know that, we've heard that, we've been challenged to do that, and for whatever reason, we rarely, if ever, open up our mouth and have a gospel conversation with the people around us. Have you ever wondered why? why? Like, why don't I share the gospel? Why don't I tell other people about Jesus? If I believe this book and I believe that Jesus is the cure to their greatest problem called sin, if I believe there's a real heaven and a real hell and eternity is as long as I think it's gonna be, then why don't I share the gospel with every person that I interface on a normal day? Can I tell you why? It's the devil, he hates the gospel. And he hates you and he hates people and he works overtime to prevent you from having gospel conversations. It's because he understands the power of the gospel, the saving power of Jesus. He understands it. I mean, the inward battle that we experience in those moments, it gives proof that that's true. I was on an airplane just a couple of weeks ago when I clearly sensed that God was telling me, you are supposed to share the gospel with the person next to you. I mean, it was clear as day. It was as if Jesus was right here and being like, You're, go, tell him now, tell him. And I'm gonna tell you, in that moment, even though it was abundantly clear that he was telling me to do that, even though this is something that I do all the time, I do it all the time, I had, in that moment, excuses filled my brain to the brim of why I shouldn't share the gospel with the person next to me. And I'm just being honest with you today. In that moment, I had excuses all over the place. Here's what I thought in that moment. I thought, number one, this is a really short flight. I don't have time to share the whole gospel with this guy. I don't. This is one of those flights. It's like Chattanooga to Atlanta. It's supposed to be like 24 minutes and it always takes like two hours. And, and, but it was one of those days where they were on time and it was 23 minutes. We had already taken off. I'm like, I've got like 20 minutes left. There's no way that I have time to share the gospel. The second thing I thought was he's got his AirPods in. He obviously don't wanna to talk to anybody. I don't know if he's listening to something, but he don't wanna to talk to me. Why would I bother him if he's listening to something? The third thing I thought was, you know what, I'm tired. I've got a long day of traveling ahead of me. I probably need to rest up before I get to Atlanta because I'm gonna have a quick turnaround. So I'm gonna rest right now. I need to be refreshed and ready to go as soon as we land. The fourth excuse that I had was, you know, I've looked this guy up and down and he already has that Christian look. So he's probably already saved. Y'all know the Christian look? Look at the person next to you, see if they've got the Christian look. Because I'm just telling you, most of y'all don't have the Christian look. <laughs> but you know, the Christian look. And, and I looked at him and I was like, you know what, he's probably already saved. He probably already knows Jesus. I don't need to waste my time and energy 
sharing the gospel with a guy who probably already knows Christ. There's so many excuses going through my head that day. And you know what? I believe the lies and I made the decision to say nothing. That's hard to say. I wish I could have ended that story a little bit differently. I wish I could have told you, but you know, you know, but I fought through the temptation to say nothing and I battled through the excuses and I ended up sharing the gospel with this guy in Chattanooga and he got saved by the time he was in Atlanta and he shared the gospel all over the airport and millions of people were, I can't tell you that because the truth is I knew that God would call me. He called me to do that and I know that I was disobedient in that moment. This was a divine appointment set up by God himself. And I can tell you in this moment that I missed it. I missed it. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever blown a divine appointment that was set up by God? Shake your head if you have. you like, you walk away and you know. Like, God set that whole thing up. And I chose to do nothing when God was calling me to be found faithful. And so one of the major reasons that we don't share the gospel, we don't share with other people is because we're afraid. Because we're afraid of failing. Because we're afraid that we're not gonna have all the answers that they're looking for. We're not gonna know enough. We're afraid that we're gonna be rejected somehow or we're gonna be embarrassed. We're afraid. And that fear leads us to disobedience so many times. When I was in my early 20s, I was having a lunch conversation with a, a friend of mine who's in ministry and he said something regarding this, this conversation that, that really stuck with me and it really changed my perspective when it comes to sharing the gospel with other people. He asked me the question over tacos. He said, Jordan, what are the three possible outcomes that can result from you sharing the gospel with somebody else? And for the first time, I really thought about it strategically. And I was like, there's three outcomes. What would they be? What would those three outcomes be? And, and I, I wrote this down as I was thinking through them. I said, well, the first outcome is that person could hear the gospel, receive Jesus, accept him and be saved. That, that's number one. The second would be they could reject Jesus. They could reject me. They could think that I'm crazy. Or the third outcome could be I share the gospel with somebody and, and they don't make a decision right there, but I have the chance to plant seeds into their life, which the Bible says is a really good thing. My friend said, you know what? You, you nailed it. That's exactly right. And then he pulled out a pen and he grabbed a napkin and he started to write on the napkin. And he said, so Jordan, what you're telling me is this. And this is what he wrote. He said, so you're telling me that if someone hears you share the gospel, they accept Jesus, that's a good outcome. I was like, yeah, that's a really good outcome. He said, or the, you could plant a seed in their life and, and you would say that that's a good outcome. I'm like, absolutely, that's a great outcome. Or they could reject you and reject the gospel and, and think that you're crazy. And if they reject, then, then that's a bad outcome. I was like, yeah, exactly. You did it exactly right. And, and as soon as he finished writing, he looked at me and he said, so what you've said is when you share the gospel with somebody else, you have a 66.6% .6 chance of having a good result. Is that right? I said, yes, that's right. He said, no, that's wrong. I was like, well, man, if I'm wrong, tell me why I'm wrong. He said, I'm not gonna tell you, open up your Bible. <laughs> he took me to 1 Peter chapter four. And let me just read this verse that he read. Verse 14, he said, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And he said, if that's not enough, let me give you another verse. And he turned to Luke chapter six, verse 22, where Jesus is speaking himself. He said, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the son of man. Jesus said, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. And so those verses tell us that when we're rejected in the name of Jesus, that when we're rejected while we're sharing the gospel, that God has rewards for us waiting in heaven that'll make our earthly rewards look silly. Do we get that? So my buddy pulls out his pen and he pulls out his napkin and he said, let's fix this once and for all. This is what he wrote. When people hear you share the gospel and they accept Jesus, that's a good result. When you plant seeds in their life, that's a good result. And according to Jesus, if you share the gospel faithfully with somebody else and they reject you, they reject the gospel, they reject the son of God, they think you are crazy. Guess what? Bible says that is a good 
result. He said, when we share Jesus with someone else, that means we are successful 100% of the time. We can't lose. He said, it's good every single time, according to God. When Jesus gave us his great commission, he didn't set us up to fail, he set us up for success. So get this, if you're taking notes today, I want you to get this, ready? When we do what Jesus tells us to do, we are successful 100% of the time. This not only applies to sharing the gospel, this, this applies to anything that Jesus tells you to do. You can think it's crazy, but guess what? If Jesus tells you to do it, you better do it. You can think, I can't, I can't do that myself, or I can't afford to do that, or that's too scary for me, or that's not my personality. Guess what? If Jesus tells you to do it, you better do it. Because he tells us when we are faithful to do what he tells us to do, we are successful 100% of the time. There are a few things about the Great Commission I believe every believer needs to understand. So if you are taking notes, I'm gonna give you five. You ready for this? The first one is this. We cannot fulfill the Great Commission without Jesus. We can't do it. None of us in here have the, the power to save anyone out there without Jesus. We can't do it by ourselves. The Bible says salvation only comes through the name of of Jesus. His name is different because his authority is different. Jesus talked about that authority in the Great Commission. Verse 18, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Remember what we talked about just a few weeks ago. The Bible says without Jesus, we can do nothing, right? He alone is the source of everything, including making disciples, Philippians chapter two, verse nine says, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. The Bible says there is no other name by which human beings can be saved, which is heartbreaking because there's a lot of people looking for salvation in other names. Let's just say this very clearly. The name Buddha won't save you. The name Muhammad won't save you. The name Joseph Smith won't save you. The name Confucius won't save you. The saving power that you're looking for is only found in one name and it is the one and only name of Jesus Christ. And as believers today, it's important for us to understand that he's given us access to his name. He's given us access to his power. He's given us access to his authority so that we can accomplish his great commission. I'll put it this way. The authority of God was given to the people of God through the word of God so that we could accomplish the work of God. I'm gonna say that again because it took me a long time to make this work, okay? The authority of God is given to the people of God through the word of God so that we can accomplish the work of God and no other reason. In other words, when God saves you, he equips you and he empowers you and he directs you and he does all of that so that he can use you. When Jesus gave us access to his name, he gave us everything we need to do the job that he's called us to do. So when it comes to the great commission, number one, we can't fulfill it without Jesus. The second thing we've got to understand is that we also cannot discriminate. We can't discriminate. And that comes right from Jesus' words in the Great Commission. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. Let me tell you something about a true disciple of Jesus Christ. A true disciple is a follower of Jesus that reproduces themselves. And that's not in your notes and it's not on the screen, it should be. We gotta get this. A true disciple is a follower of Jesus that reproduces themselves. You ought to have a downline if you're a disciple of Jesus. And that doesn't come from me, it comes straight from his mouth. He's talking about disciples and followers of Christ and he says, my disciples will bear much fruit. It's, he didn't say might bear much, he said you will bear much fruit. And so us going is one of the ways that we do that. Jesus tells us to preach the gospel. He tells us to make disciples all over the world. 
In other words, he tells us, don't discriminate when it comes to sharing the message of the gospel with the people around you. The gospel isn't for just this group or this group. It's for all groups. That's why our church has so many ministries and mission efforts around the world. It's why we get excited about mission giving and we celebrate your generosity so that our church can accomplish this part of the Great Commission. It's why we get so fired up about what God is doing in places like Nepal or or Egypt, or I could stand up here and name a whole bunch of places where God is at work, Haiti and so on. I mean, it's amazing to see how God has positioned us to make a gospel difference in these places. It's why we continue to go on mission and why we continually give to support the 4,000 plus missionary families that we help fund through the International Mission Board. Listen, those are our missionaries that are counting on us. And when we invest in them, it's partially our responsibility in fulfilling this part of the Great Commission. Listen, when it comes to the Great Commission, Jesus said, you cannot discriminate. This gospel is for everybody. The third thing that Jesus makes very clear in the Great Commission is that we cannot ignore baptism. I'll say it again. We cannot ignore baptism. Jesus is talking. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now let me say this about baptism. Baptism, according to Jesus, is when someone, after they repent of their sin, and after they believe in Jesus and trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're baptized. And the Bible doesn't make baptism an option ever. Never is baptism an option for a true disciple of Jesus. But the Bible says that we must baptize them. And that word baptize, it actually comes from the word baptizo, which literally means to immerse in water. That's what baptism means. And that's why we baptize the way that we do. We baptize the way that Jesus was baptized. We also baptize in the way that he tells us to be baptized, which is immersed in water after a person has repented of their sin, turned to Jesus as Lord and Savior, and trusted him with everything, surrendering their life to Christ. And notice what Jesus says in this text. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? If you write in your Bible, I want you to circle the name, okay? I want you to circle that. I want you to highlight that. Draw a line to the side of the page, and I want you to write this down. The Greek word here for name has the definite article in front of it, which means that it can only be translated as singular, as singular. The name can only be translated as singular. And that's important to understand because we baptize in the singular name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every believer is baptized in the name, the singular name of the Holy Trinity. You see, there's one God that eternally exists in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see that these three are one. And when we're baptized, we are baptized in his name. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a singular name, God. When it comes to the Great Commission, the Bible says we cannot ignore baptism. It's not an option, according to Jesus. It's an act of obedience where we get to say yes to Jesus and we get to do something that may seem crazy to us and he wants us to do it according to his terms and not the terms of man. The fourth thing that we hear in this text is this, that we can't neglect discipleship. We can't neglect discipleship. Verse 20 goes on to say, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Do you see that? Some pastors refer to this as the great omission of the great commission. Because there are many Christians, there are many denominations, there are even churches who share the gospel and they baptize new believers, but but they really kind of end it at that. They never teach people how to know God. They never teach people how to walk with God. You see, according to Jesus, baptism isn't the finish line. It's the starting line which ought to speak something to us, even as parents, that it's not enough just to teach our kids about Jesus to get them to the point of praying a prayer or walking an aisle or being dunked in a pool of water. 
That ought to be the beginning, right? Uh, We ought to be prepared in that moment to to walk them through what it looks like to follow Jesus and make Jesus a priority. We ought to be demonstrating to our kids what that looks like. That's what he means, to teach them to observe everything Christ commanded. You say, what did Christ command? Well, that's a good question. And the answer to that is everything in the Old Testament Everything in the Gospels, everything in the New Testament, it doesn't matter if Christ commanded it through the prophets or the apostles or if Christ said it himself. If he said it, we gotta teach it. That's the great commission according to Jesus. And you know what? The same is true for churches like ours. People love to assume that churches like this one, churches that see a lot of people saved, and see a lot of people baptized that that we don't have an emphasis on discipleship, which couldn't be further from the truth. Man, we understand the importance of teaching people the word of God. We understand the importance of equipping people for the work of ministry, and that's why we have literally hundreds of Bible studies that happen uh, every single week. We have Bible studies on this campus. We have Bible studies off campus. We have Bible studies on different days of the week. We have Bible studies in different languages because we know that the disciples of Jesus have to be taught the word of God if they're gonna know the word of God and if they're gonna share the word of God. And let me just take a moment and make this a little commercial and just say, in my opinion, this right here is not enough for a Christian. Showing up to big church is not enough in my opinion. I believe we ought to be doing life with one another. We ought, to, we ought to be engaging in conversations and digging as deep as we can. And I believe that that only happens in the context of small groups. That's why we have small groups. Every single hour we have worship on Sunday mornings. That's why we have a bunch of small groups and we've, we have signups for those in the comments today that happen throughout the week. That's why you can have an online Bible study We believe we ought to be together sharpening each other as iron sharpens iron. We ought to be teaching each other the word of God. And so let me just encourage you, if this is is the extent of your church experience on Sunday, man, take a step this year and just try it. Try it. And you'll see that there is power in studying the Bible together. When it comes to the Great Commission, we cannot ignore Discipleship. In fact, let's just review where we've been so far. It says, we can't fulfill it without Jesus. We can't discriminate. We can't ignore baptism and we cannot neglect discipleship. Let me give you one more that we've learned in this text today. And that is that we can't do it alone. Jesus wants us to know you can't do this alone. In fact, in verse 20, Jesus concluded this by saying, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love the way Jesus ended this message because he reminds us that as we're living on mission, as we're doing our part to fulfill this commission, that he is with us every single step of the way. We don't have to do this in our own strength or our own power. That Jesus walks with us. He gives us his presence. He gives us the power of almighty God. He's given us access to his name and his authority and his power, and he guides us. And the Bible says he goes before us and he gives us divine appointments where we have the opportunity to say yes or no. But when you look at these letters and these words, it's pretty clear that he told us to go. He said, go make disciples of all nations. He says, you ought to be a part of making disciples right here in Cleveland, Bradley County. You ought to be able to look, put next to, next to your name, Jerusalem, Who am I making disciples of right now in my Jerusalem? In our Judea and Samaria, can we say that we're making disciples in the surrounding towns? When we look at the uttermost parts of the earth, can we look at the uttermost parts of the earth and say, man, we're making disciples that are making disciples all around the world. Listen, we have to be people, followers of Jesus that prioritize the things of God. And you know why? I mean, let's just get right down to it. It's because it's the only thing that's gonna matter in 100 million years. The only thing, the only thing. So man, when I think about that, when I hear that, I'm asking the question, man, how how am I doing with this right now? If this is the priority of my life, according to Jesus, if this is my one job, man, how am I doing? If I were to evaluate my life right now, if I were to imagine myself standing before Jesus right now. That appointment that's going to come for every single one of us where we're held accountable for what we did and didn't do on planet earth. I mean, what's he gonna say to us right now if the appointment's this afternoon? 
how are you doing at work? Are you making disciples at work? Or what about online and the influence and that he's given you online? What about in your friend group? What about at your school, on your team, among your friends, in your relationships? Has sharing Jesus been a priority for us up to this point in our journey? I think a, a lot of us as believers, we would have to admit up to this point, it really hasn't been, right? I mean, sharing Jesus is an afterthought for a lot of people. We're, we're glad that he saved us, but we don't necessarily want to be the voice that's sharing him with the people around us. Listen, today could be a new day. Today could be a day where we decide that we are gonna fulfill our part in obeying Jesus and fulfilling the great commission in our lifetime. And that can start today. You could say, I'm gonna put a stake in the ground today. I'm not gonna look backwards. I'm gonna look at today and forwards. And as of today, moving forward, I'm gonna be found faithful. I'm gonna encourage you, start sharing Jesus today. Share him with somebody today. You never know the impact that that's gonna make, not only in their lives, but in the lives around them. I can tell you one thing, you are guaranteed success. So you might as well start now.